Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to um, another in our um, very long running and continuingly um, long running series um, of Centre for Global Higher Education webinars. Um, it is a great pleasure um, as um, a Deputy Director standing, I'm standing in for Simon today, but um, I'm David Mills and I'm going to be introducing today's speaker and chairing. And you know, as I said, it's a great pleasure to welcome Michael Newman from London Met University and also with affiliation to New York University in London to tell us about a really fascinating case study from the 1980s. Um, the title is Fascism, Free Speech and Academic Freedom. And we were just reflecting in the green room while we were waiting, waiting for everyone to come that you know we can learn an awful lot from um, past um, crises in universities and how they're handled because this is, these things are not new um, and the ways in which institutions manage these situations are, are, are always um, telling. And so uh, I'm looking forward to a really interesting um, historical case study today. And um, as always, you know, we very much welcome comments and questions afterwards. So let me just, um, as always, do the, do the quick housekeeping announcements. Um, we are recording this webinar. And um, along with all the 400 plus other ones, they're going to be available on the website, Research TGHE, and tomorrow, hopefully, or soon after. And I would add here that we're going to be um, updating our website. So these are going to be much more searchable um, in a couple of months' time. So you can go back and find, find things you want to find. Um, as normal, please keep yourself muted. Um, you don't need to have a video on. Um, you can use speaker view. To, um, to listen to Michael as he, as he shows his slides um, and ask questions in the chat. And after about half an hour or so, when Michael finishes, then um, I'll invite you to come forward and, and um, ask your questions. So uh, nothing, no further ado, um, I will um, stop sharing my slides and I'll hand the screen to Michael. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And um, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not actually showing any slides. It's just me, I'm afraid. No problem at all. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm really pleased to do the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say I owe a lot of thanks to a few other people, a few other veterans of the PNL crisis with whom I shared drafts of earlier versions of this paper. And also, um, I want to thank a couple of people, Peter Fisher and Louise Slater, who've done fantastic work at London Met um on the archives and also given me massive help so my my subjects a case that had prominence a, a lot of national prominence uh 40 years ago as it very nearly brought about the closure or dismemberment of the polytechnic of north london pnl and it also had importance for the whole sector and i think these issues of that day definitely have a lot of relevance for now. Um, lots of the uh, issues are ra were raised about free speech and academic freedom, and they're still very, very current. And I think it also has warnings as well as lessons. Before I go any further, I want to clarify two points. First of all, the issue, the person at the centre of the crisis was called Patrick Harrington. And at that time, he was an influential figure in the youth section of the National Front, which was a far right racist party. And at the same time, he was a student at PNL. But I want to make clear my references to him are solely about that period. Subsequently, he stated in an interview in the Alternative Green magazine that he voted for the disbandment of the National Front in 1989. He's rethought, rejected or refined lots of his past positions, many of his past positions, and he hopes people will judge him on his current ideas and actions rather than refight the battles of the past. And I'm happy to acknowledge that. Um, but my talk today is about the mid 1980s and the issues raised then and not about Patrick Harrington now. I also want to make it clear that although London Metropolitan University, one of its um, past um, institutions that it came out of was UNL. It's adopted many, many policies on anti-racism, equal opportunities and diversity. Um, and 
the institution I'm talking about then is not the institution that is London Met now. Okay, um, I think there are lots of parallels, uh, including in the in the political context that we're now in in the UK and uh, similarly in many other places, I think. So the current Conservative government, particularly since Brexit, has been increasingly right wing in various ways, I would say, including depicting universities as dominated by intolerant views. And there's been much attention on the denial of platforms for speakers and so-called council culture. And those demands for, uh, led to, sorry, those issues led to demands for new measures to ensure free speech on campuses against proclaimed forces of intolerance uh, by those practicing woke views, uh, as they've been called. And that also led to the creation of the new Office for Students, OFS, and last June, the appointment of Arif Ahmed, Professor Arif Ahmed, as the new director for freedom of speech and academic freedom. We don't know what this will lead to, um, but concerns have been raised that despite its professed purpose of guaranteeing academic freedom, the new Office for Students could provide a platform for those who aim to under, undermine diversity and those seeking to combat structural inequalities. And we don't know the implications of the fact that students, staff and others will be able to lodge a complaint with the OFS if they feel penalised by a student or student, by university or student union for exercising their right to free speak. Now I want to recall the situation in the aftermath of the Conservative uh, election under Margaret Thatcher in 1979 and it ha what was still happening uh, in the 1980s. Clearly it was uh, committed to a free market ideology and that had a lot of implications, great implications for higher education. But it wasn't only neoliberalism. For the new Secretary of State, uh, Sir Keith Joseph, had also been a leading figure in the right-wing think tank, the Centre for Policy Studies, which was, in the words of a sort of classic book of the era, written in 1990 uh, by Harold Silver, a book called Education, Change and the Policy Progress, I'm sorry, Pro Policy Process, Keith Joseph was determined to counter what he saw as undue Marxist influence in higher education, especially in social studies departments in the polytechnic sector. In the mid 80s, soon after that, Harrington would be portrayed as the victim of the extreme left. A quick background to the crisis. There were two key locations. One was in the humanities faculty uh, and for those who, you who know London, this was based in Kentish Town in Camden, and that's where Harrington's degree course was based. The other, about two miles to the east in Islington, was in a place called Ladbrook House, which was the main studies for the social studies faculty. PL had been established in 1971 as one of the new polys of the era. And it was complex. It was a complex institution. It was geographically dispersed. It had differing component parts that had quite different educational cultures and traditions. Confusingly, in terms of terminology, it was made up of two previously existing polytechnics. One was called uh, Northwestern Polytechnic, and its main site was in Kentish Town. And the other was the Northern Polytechnic, and its main site was on in Holloway Road. And the Northern Polytechnic was much more science-based, and that was also where the central administration was situated and where the director and his associate directors and the secretary of the Court of Governors and so on was, was based. And one element, not 
well, a, an important element, though not perhaps the most important, was that there was a feeling of distance and separateness and um, between both Kentish Town and Labrook House and the central administration. These were not, uh, it was not a very cohesive institution, to put it mildly. Another complexity of PNL and the other new polys was their governance structures different from more traditional universities, for local authorities played a key role. And for PNL, this was the largest of all, I think, the Inner London Education Authority, ILIA. And ILIA was very strongly represented within the Court of Governors. Um, that actually, as I'll explain a bit later on, was crucial in pulling PNL back from the brink of closure. But there were tensions. There were tensions between the director, the so-called directorate, um, and Ilya about Ilya's role in the governing body, which was big, and all that would be greatly exacerbated by the crisis, uh, so that the governors and it, as a decision-making body were fairly dis dysfunctional. Another highly relevant uh, background to PNL was that it came out of an era of strong, the so-called era of 1986. Um, there had been occupations very recently in 68 in uh, LSE and Hornsey College of Art, which was very much down the road from where the Polytechnic was. And within the Polytechnic, there were activists, left-wing students and staff, um, and there was a strong presence in Labrook House of the Socialist Workers' Party, SWP, and there were all sorts of other forms of activism as well, if you like, but they were all fueled by the appointment of the first director, whose name was Terence Miller, and he'd been principal of the University of College of Rhodesia before uh, Zimbabwe uh, from 1967 to 69. And that was during the years of illegal, unrecognized minority white rule. And so it was controversial going there. And he remained PNL director until 1980. But it wasn't only his background, he was also a combative figure. And he became very deeply involved in internal conflicts against the left. Uh, and there were several student occupations during his period in charge. So particularly in right wing circles, PNL gained a negative reputation in this era. His successor was somebody called Dr. David McDowell. And David McDowell was a scholar of ancient history and he'd been a former civil servant and he'd been master of University College, Durham University, quite a traditional university. And in his own retrospective account of his time at PNL, he acknowledged that he'd never previously stepped inside a polytechnic, and he was unaware of the governance systems of the new institutions. So he was, I would say, a surprising choice of leader for an inner city, city polytechnic with the kind of uh, student population it had. There was a further important dimension to all this though. Although there was a strong Marxist left, lots of different branches, but there was in Ladbroke House, there was also very sharp polarization. During the 1970s, Caroline Cox became head of Department of Sociology, and very soon she was a leading campaigner against what she per perceived as Marxist bias in higher education. And in 1975, while still at PNL, she outlined the views in a co-authored book with two, un two other members of staff entitled The Rape of Reason, The Corruption of the Polytechnic of North London. After leaving PNL in 1977, she also became a member of the Centre for Policy Studies with Keith Joseph. And once the Thatcher government 
was elected to power, she became a life peer in the House of Lords, taking the title Baroness Cox uh, a few months in 1983, March 1983. Just before this, a couple of months earlier, a lecturer in sociology who was very strongly opposed to the left at PNL as well, resigned and on the 20th of February 1983 she wrote to the chairman of the Council of National Ac Academic Wards, Awards, CNAA, which award was responsible for degrees in the polytechnic sector in that era. She wrote with a copy to Keith Joseph. In her letter she made several allegations including that there was a hegemonic power of Marxists and fellow travellers in the school and that there was academic bias and looseness in the new degree, or in the submission for a new degree in applied social studies. As a result, a CNAA inspection took place in April 1983, which endorsed the continuation of both courses, clearing them of the charges. But Joseph, Keith Joseph, then announced another inspection by uh, Her Majesty's Inspector at HMI, which more typically uh, inspected schools, and it, in its port, report, sorry, in October 1983, it included some positive comments on PNL's provision, but it made some significant criticisms. And when these were publicised, the net result was to exacerbate the attacks upon PNL as a focal point for a, a wider policy agenda, I would say, in relation to higher education. And quoting Silver again uh, in his book in 1990, he said, the public impact and what was made of it added to the impression of higher education of a drift of dark forces of work, of incompetence, of failure. These perceptions of PNL, which were cult, cultivated in high government circles and the majority of the press uh, were taking place just before the eruption of the Harrington affair and they made it, the Polytechnic, very vulnerable to the, in this new crisis. In fact, PNL also conformed to a lot of the key aspirations of the 1960s Labour government in setting up the polys. It had a a commitment to a student-centred curriculum and pedagogy with flexible structures, challenging the traditional domination of single subjects, and the access mission and innovative teaching and course development were t taken very seriously, I would say. It was a complex place, PNL, and it certainly had its problems, but the external perceptions of it were always a misrepresentation. OK, the Harrington affair. Now, I'm not going to give a detailed narrative of it, but I do need to explain its early stages and also to emphasise the whirlwind nature of the transformative experience that there was for the institution as a whole and for all the people involved in it. Even in the humanities faculty, the, the centre of the crisis, very few people were aware of any problems at all until March 1984. Um, I was actually in the department giving a personal aspect, but I knew nothing about it until March 1984. Nine months later, only nine months later, the institution was threatened to closure or dismemberment. Harrington himself had been admitted to a combined degree in history and philosophy at uh, the beginning of the year, academic year 82-83. And on the whole, he'd kept a low profile in that period. Um, after April 1983, the student newspaper published an article with a photo about National Front activities in North London. And then from those some students identified Harrington as the person in the photo. And this was corroborated by Searchlight, uh, the anti-fascist organisation. In June 1983, 
Fuse carried a second article identifying Harrington and describing it in its word, describing him, sorry, in its words, as a leading member of the National Front. The National Front, a little background, it was never a major electoral force at national level, but in the 1970s, it made gains in some areas, including parts of London. And in 1976, in a local council by-election in Deptford in London, the National Front and a breakaway faction, the National Party, secured nearly 45% of the vote, pushing the Conservatives into fourth place. And then of equal significance, anti-fascism, anti and anti-national front was all, also fast growing by then. Uh, and there was confrontation. And when the far right uh, planned to march through another London borough, Lewisham, in August 1977, they were greeted by mass demonstrations and by a minority of the protesters with violent clashes. This was also when the Anti-Nazi League was created, particularly by the SWP, which I've already mentioned at PNL, to combat the National Front. Now, the National Front, whenever the National Front was prominent, wherever it was prominent, activists per perpetrated violence against black and other ethnic minority populations. Both because of the size of the protests and perhaps also because of the clear move to the right on immigration by the Conservatives under Margaret Thatcher's leadership before the 1979 election, the NF then declined and split, but it was still active in particular locations. And in those locations, there were often physical confrontations with anti-fascists, racial violence by sympathisers with the National Front, and intimidation. And the National Front was also associated with drawing up hit lists against its opponents. And one location was Chapel Market in Islington. And it was there that the student union, uh, sorry, the student newspaper identified Harrington as present in a National Front role. After the second article, on the 7th of July, which was during the summer vacation, Harrington took an action that wasn't known by, it was only known by very few, not me, certainly, at the time in PNL. His solicitor wrote to Dr. David McDowell, the PNL director, saying the article was defamatory to our client in the extreme and has caused him to be extremely concerned about the future of his studies at PNL. It also claimed that he was not a leading member of the National Front, as the most elevated position that he'd ever held was as secretary of the local Wandsworth branch. And it rejected um, other allegations, but it said that he anticipates the hostility engendered, i.e. by the article, may turn to violence or at the very least harassment. And it asked for the director's assurance that this would not be allowed to happen. Now, the key aspect of that letter was that it established the narrative that Harrington simply wanted to concentrate on his education, that his private political views were irrelevant, and that he was victim of intolerance by those infringing his rights. And that would continue throughout all the crisis months, and it was effectively held up by High Court hearings. In July 1983, on behalf of the director, the assistant director for personnel had, uh, had assured Harrington's solicitor that the Polytechnic would under no circumstance discriminate against a student on account of his or her political beliefs or activities provided there was no breach of the Poly's code of conduct. And it had every intention of ensuring he was allowed to continue his studies peacefully without any har harassment. No further action at directorate level seems to have been taken. And actually, uh, a, a committee, a commission of inquiry, which I'll mention uh, again a bit later, was highly critical of that and said it should have been taken as a continuing threat to the institution. And the management should, at that point, 
to have undertaken a great deal of discussion uh, with all concerned uh, about possible solutions and problems, but it didn't. Harrington attended very few lectures or seminars during the first semester of the second year, and the semester went until February. Um, sorry, the semester went until January, and the second semester started in February. But in January, in other words, just before the second semester, he was informed that his attendance had been unsatisfactory. But he was then allowed to transfer to a single subject in, Feb in philosophy at the for the beginning of the second semester in February. Very soon after that, some students took evidence of his National Front activity and role to the philosophy staff, saying they did not want to share seminars and lectures with him as they felt threatened by his presence and concerned that information about them could potentially be passed on. And members of academic staff in, in the philosophy department agreed with that. On the 8th of March, in other words, very short time later, pickets prevented Harrington attending his lectures and the number of pickets grew up, grew during the day. The next day he was offered alternative teaching by himself, but he, after a moment, after a short hesitation, he rejected that. Now, I want to highlight um, a motion, a resolution of a branch of the academic staff union. It was a, a precursor to UKU, which is now the main union. It was called NATFI um, in Kentish Town on the following week, on the 15th of March, because the proposal it made would soon command extremely wide support within the faculty and later also uh, in other branches of the union and amongst academic staff, a wide support amongst academic staff. But at that point, it was a much smaller affair, but the branch unanimously agreed this resolution. It expresses its grave concern at the presence of a prominent and active member of the National Front as a student in Kentish Town. Secondly, it expresses its strong support for the students who feel offended and intimidated by his presence in classes and for the philosophy staff. And thirdly, it calls upon the Court of Governors and the Directorate to develop as a matter of urgency a polytechnic anti-racialist policy and to take the circumstances of this case into account when doing so. Now, in practice, that was very close to the formula eventually implemented after the nine month crisis. But events were now moving really fast and that possible compromise was very soon squeezed out. Instead, during the Easter break, Harrington's solicitors warned that proceedings would be taken against PNL and less assurances about his teaching were given by the 11th of April. The directorate tried to find a way to get uh, a continuation of separate teaching, but uh, they weren't prepared to consider an ultimatum and Harrington would not, and his solicitors would not accept com compromise proposals using arguments for free speech and the right to education. He took out a writ of summons against PNL against various student bodies uh, and, and uh, individual students. And on the 25th of April, still during the Easter holiday, the High Court issued orders for compliance against all the students while, while the order against PNL was adjourned. I think this was the time uh, when the opportunity of compromise passed. And I think that the point of no return probably came on the 1st of May when there was a picket of about 150 people. Photos were taken uh, for 
hiring solicitors, uh, or, or not officially, but they were given, uh, of the protesters, and 20 of those photos were marked by a cross for identification, and that led to an ever-escalating crisis, with arrests, police, court tip staff in the building, and occupations whenever Harrington was due to have his classes. And by now, SWP and its uh, the Socialist Workers Student Society were playing a key organisational role. But I would stress that the action was supported across a wide spectrum of student opinion. At this point, I need to mention um, another dimension which came in very soon after that. When the High Court held upheld Harrington's legal claims, the PNL management, the directorate and governors were called on to identify the students marked with the cross. And then the director transferred those obligations to heads of department and course tutors, the people in charge of courses, in the humanities and social studies faculties to identify the students. That led to various internal attempts to coerce obedience by the, those members of staff and a much wider group from both faculties who supported those members of staff in, in not identifying the students. And it culminated in two heads of department and 12 course tutors facing contempt proceedings in the High Court and Court of Appeal with imprisonment as a possible penalty with the case returning to the High Court in September. And then in September, uh, a, a, a new judge, a pragmatic judge, made an attempt to defuse the situation by saying that no purpose would be served by attempting to enforce the identification because the Polytechnic seemed to be quiet, but the Polytechnic was quiet because it was a summer vacation. The whole episode led to a, a breakdown of trust between the directorate and wide numbers of staff. Um, and the staff involved on the, um, may have had different views, uh, but in general, I think overwhelmingly didn't actually support the student action, but believed that identifying students effectively to the National Front might both be putting them at risk and was a betrayal of trust. And they also sympathised with the motivation and the student's political or ethical stance in relation to the National Front. So the denouement came about in the next academic year. Um, when in the next year started in October, by then, the majority of academic staff, staff unions, other unions with the Polytechnic and even the National Students Union outside thought that the continuing action was, was not going to work and that it put the future of the Polytechnic at risk. But no calls for restraint made any difference. And throughout the autumn term, there were court cases a police presence on the campus, student arrests on disorder and other offences, and also constant ex-escalation. Finally, on the 29th of November, two students were imprisoned for 16 days for contempt of court, but nothing had con that didn't, and nothing else contained this, the action. And every time there was an attempt to divert teaching to another building, it provoked occupation of that building. And every time that happened, students who'd not previously involved became involved and were also arrested. By the end of the autumn term, no resolution seemed to be in sight. Har and new cases had been taken to court. Harrington took another case after the end of term, 17th and 18th of December, uh, new contempt against 16 named students and also called for the sequestration of PNL's assets in view of its alleged breach of an earlier court, High Court order. PNL again made an application that Harrington should be taught privately, 
and again that was not agreed. On the other hand, behind the scenes some very big changes were happening. Earlier I mentioned the role of Ilya in piano governance and its crucial role. Since the late 1970s, Ilya had been taking a lot of steps to recognise institutional racism in schools and had established codes of practice to implement uh, the 1976 Race Relations Act in the institutions it controlled. It also soon recognised the necessity for PNL to address the issue of racism in relation to Harrington. Um, and the chair of Ilya's Further and Higher Education uh, Committee was someone called Neil Fletcher, and he was playing both a public and a private and a less public role because he was also on the Court of Governors. Um, and he, he'd addressed students uh, pickets and he'd uh, said it, he, it, you know, it was good that the dangers of fascism were being brought to light and he urged the introduction of a new code, code of practice on racism and he said that all, new, all students should have to um, sign something saying they'd respect Ilya policies for supporting the development of a multi-ethnic society. But there was complete deadlock within the Court of Governors um, Ilya and staff governors pushed in that direction. The chair and the director often seemed to be focused more on instituting disciplinary procedures. And they were also under pressure, the directorate, from the opposite side. For example, in a well-known editorial at the time, on the 18th of May, the Times had published an editorial entitled Totalitarian no Nursery, which described PNL as a rather sad institution and recommended the exclusion of the troublemakers and the closure of its intellectually substandard courses. And there were further, there were demands that went further than that. There was, in theory, movement over the summer, but because of the day-to-day -day crisis getting ever worse, in practice, nothing was happening. But then, Patrick Harrington finally blemished his image of being an, an entirely innocent victim. In a Thames television interview on the 29th of November, he asserted that black students at PNL should be gradually repatriated and that black people could not be regarded as legitimate citizens. In response to a supplementary question about curtail, whether that meant curtailing civil liberties along racial lines, he argued, I don't believe black people can be citizens of Britain, and therefore as citizens are the only ones who have rights, their rights are non-existent. This led to complaints by students and by 17 members of the sociology department who called upon the director to, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the director suspend Harrington, ha but the director refused to do so on procedural grounds. And it was at that point that Ilya stepped in. And although Ilya didn't have the actual power, direct power to dismiss the director, the then leader of Ilya persuaded Dr. McDowell to resign in a deal under which he was given a sabbatical year. Nor did Ilya have the power to direct uh, the direct power to appoint a successor, but Francis Morell turned to someone who was called John Beeson, who was then director of South Bank Poly, and Ilya sought to stabilise PNL by establishing the committee of inquiry into the effectiveness of internal management and organisation, and also made it clear to the governors that the future of PNL depended on the acceptance of both Bishan, in the first instance as acting director, and the Committee of Inquiry, and that was formally agreed at the end of December. Bishan understood left-wing activism. He had a reputation for resolving disputes through unorthodox and sometimes ruthless methods. 
He was also well aware of what was happening at PNL and the dangers of closure. He agreed to take the job, provided, and Ilya also told him that it would be a disaster, they thought, for educational provision in North London and for particular types of educational provision if PNL was closed down. He took the job, uh, provided he could bring his own team. And he then established what was really a sophistry, a, a strategy, uh, by providing something under a different name, which was really what had been proposed much earlier. The strategy was to give Harrington the official timetabled classes alone in another building, while all other students had unofficial classes in the original building, their original building, Kentish Town. Um, he took other initiatives. He secured, uh, he, uh, even in addressing the, the immediate crisis, I won't go into those now, but his compromise solution held more or less until Harrington completed his degree in summer 1985. And under that short period, PNL became far more embedded in local level. It addressed many more of the communities of North London by new degrees, new research activities, and also by introducing anti-racism uh, and diversity policies, which had not been implemented up until that Really, the essence of my argument to close is that I think it was only possible to address and resolve the issues by accepting both the strength of feeling and the um, both, both sorry both the strength of feeling and the legitimacy of the feelings. Um, and my argument would be that this is also true now, that the Office of Students will only be able to act if it understands, um, even if it doesn't always sympathise with the force behind particular demands, which are often still to do with racism, but clearly there are other issues as well. Um, and I would say that institutions need to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, and there needs to be a recognition of some autonomy for institutions and also some um, wider conception of academic freedom within the institutions. Um, I think uh, it's only by recognising broader notions of academic freedom that solutions can be found. And I hope that the Harrington episode is just one episode towards um, something be which become more inclusive institutions, but I fear it could also be a pre it could also, if handled wrongly, be a precedent for trying to solve complex problems through simplistic formulae. Thanks, sorry, I went on a bit long. No, Michael, I was I was gripped. I, I couldn't, uh, you, you told a really great story there and one that um, the, the, the detail of, of your, your archival sort of uncoverings and, and, and reconstruction is, is, is really important. So please, um, colleagues, um, you're welcome to post questions in the chat. I'm gonna get going just with a, a, a initial couple of sort of clarificatory questions. One is that I think in 1981, um, there was a sort of an emergency sort of research selectivity exercise that, that Keith Joseph led. And I think that led to some major cuts in funding for some of the new universities, um, particularly Aston, I think, and, and possibly several others, Bradford and Salford. Now, was, was that a context here as well, which was a, a, a sudden cut in funding for the institution? Do you know that, Michael? Sorry, I'm trying to remember. Uh, we had several rounds of mm. um, cuts. I, I, 
I, I imagine there was probably one in 1981. I, I, I don't specifically remember it, but what I do remember and was a constant pressure was that there was, we, we were actually, yes, I, because I was a member of the academic board at that time, and there were constant pressures and we mm. were under, and, and that was another factor. I don't yeah. specifically yeah. remember the date 81, yeah. but that was another factor on what was going, going on. There was this constant sense yeah. of the provision yeah. being very vulnerable. Absolutely. Um, and so, um, it, it, as I said, I don't, specifically remember that particular day but it was constant yes oh and that's fine and i think you're right that, that just that conveys to everyone and even at that point the you know the research council for social sciences was under huge pressure as well because keith joseph had commissioned um a, you know a commission of inquiry into its utility and its i guess its bias as well um and in the end it was exonerated and sent to swindon but i mean i think um that that that, that also adds to this my, my final question then is um where was the CNA governing board in all this? Because the, the PNL was obviously overseen by the CNAA governors. Did, did they attempt to get involved? Well, as I said, the CNAA clearly tried. Mm. Um, it, it's, its report, if you remember, I said that this member of staff Mm. Um, who was a, a, a strong opponent of the left within the Polytechnic and the left more generally, I think, uh, but certainly within the Polytechnic, um, wrote to the chair of the CNAA with the complaints uh, yep. that she made and asked for an, in, uh, and copied it to Sir Keith Joseph. Mm -hmm. and the CNAA instituted uh, an inspection and it it broadly well overwhelmingly exonerated uh the uh two uh, degree mm -hmm. uh, departments um of the claims that have been made and said that the that the that the, the degrees that they were you know problems in any degrees but that basically they were doing what they said they were doing and there was no grounds for the complaint um and the keith joseph was not satisfied and another inspection was immediately ordered through the hmi her majesty's inspector which didn't normally inspect polytechnics um there, there, there were one or two others that I think were. Um, and that report was the one that was then very, very much more critical, although even it had some strong points, but that was much more critical. And there were, there were some, uh, the CNAA didn't officially, as, as far as I remember, say anything about the report, but certainly amongst um, a network of social scientists at the time, there were there were lots of holes picked in the HMI's report and mm. um, arguments that uh, they weren't sub sub substantiated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it all moved on. And I, I don't remember the governing body of, of the CNAA um, stating anything publicly. No, perhaps they wouldn't. And perhaps my question was more about behind the scenes intervention, because, of course, you know, as you say, that you know, they, they probably their role was formal oversight rather than anything else. We've got some um, great questions in the chat now, um, Michael. So um, let's go to those. Some of them are more about what the implications are for the present. Um, and I hope that's OK if you if you're happy to answer and reflect on those. Solomon and um, hi, hi, Solomon. How are you doing? Well, welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Do you want to ask your first question? Yeah. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Indeed, welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. That was a, an outstanding presentation. And I just live on, on Honzi Road, yeah? uh, the backyard of London Maid. And that was also a nice political history, yeah? a lesson in political history for me of the area I live in. So I put two questions there. So I, I, I just want to, to, to hear your opinion on, 
should there be tolerance of all viewpoints uh, in academia? Um, because promoting freedom of equal opportunities in the name of freedom of expression, I, I don't think we need to encourage views and opinions that are probably regressive, oppressive, and objectively incorrect, like climate change is a hoax mm -hmm. or racism. So should we give uh, you know things that Herbert Marcuse, philosopher Marcuse calls repressive tolerance? Should we tolerate, give forum to someone who wants to come to academia and talk about climate change, the hoax? Good. Or racist views? Views that marginalize you know, people from different communities and people from different walks of life. So tolerance of such views should be really repressive. And we should not allow people, for example, to debate the existence of other people. Okay, that, that worries me a lot. And the story you told beautifully has uh, a clear link and a clear connection with what is going on now. So should we allow tolerance of all viewpoints in academia, even the ones that are re repressive and very regressive? And in what ways I believe academia should fight, should fight back in what in what ways do you think academia can fight back initiatives like you know the office of students who try to protect and allow the expression of these views which would be very problematic and disturbing thank you michael good thank you okay thank you um i i don't think all views should be tolerated um but i also think that some views that I certainly would wildly disagree with may be tolerated. In other words, I think that the problem is complex. One of the, if I could just answer it in a slightly roundabout way, I think that it was necessary and it will still no doubt need to go further. In 1984, institutions, not only Polytechnic of North London, but other institutions. Uh, I, I don't think any institutions at the time, as far as I'm aware, had rigorous anti-racist policies or rigorous anti-sexist policies. Um, I think it was already, if you like, you know, in, in schools, there were anti-racist policies, certainly in Ilia schools, which I think already should have been there in um, higher education, but they weren't. I think the action that students took, even, um, you know, whether you, you, the, the motivation between the action they took led to some change. And I think change does come when often when people feel very strongly about um, an injustice and an in, in discrimination, and I think things have to have to change as a result of that. I don't uh, think it's sufficient myself to take an abstract view, completely devoid of context, which says all forms of free free speech should always be tolerated. I've, I've never taken that position. Oh, actually, I'm not being true to myself. I have taken that position, but I changed. Um, uh, um, I changed actually partly as a result of what happened at Polytechnic of North London while I was there. And since then, I've, I've, I've had a, a different position on all of that. Um, so I, I think... Um, it's, I don't take it as an abstract uh, formula always that all forms of free speech should be to, should be tolerated. But nor do I, th and I think change has to happen. I think um, anti-racism did change. It will probably need to change further. It's an ongoing issue as to exactly where the boundaries are. And the boundaries change over time and they change because people feel strongly about things and people feel there is an in injustice. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think climate climate change uh, denial is uh, is uh, a ludicrous idea. Um, 
but to be honest, I haven't thought through my own position on whether I, I, I think at the moment, um, if a student still felt that climate change was um, a myth, I'm not sure that I would want to ban the student from saying that. I think it has to be judged by context and time, and it will change over time. What I don't think is sufficient is to take um, uh, the law at any one point as expressing something that's fixed for all time. Um, so that law changes also as a result of, of, of protests and change and feelings of injustice. I think that these are complex issues. I don't think they're easy. What I'm, what I'm afraid of is setting up an office for students in a, a, in a climate which is one which has been um, trying to delegitimize um, issues about colonialism or woke um, and and then taking a completely abstract position on free free speech devoid from, from, from that context sorry I'm not sure whether I'm making exactly clear what I'm saying so what I'm saying is I'm agreeing with a lot of a lot of what you're saying but I but I I, I, I don't think it's a simple issue Great, great. Thank you. That's 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 um, very helpful, Michael. And just, just this clarity. I mean, obviously, if, um, for students, was set up before um, the, the sort of um, the higher education freedom of speech bill was put into place in twenty twenty one. I think in response to that, the office of student then put in place a sort of consultation about its regulatory role. So the, the, that's a particular part of what it does. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to ask the two Peters, um, Peter Kyo and Peter Scott both in the chats who are both are asking similar but really interesting questions to perhaps ask their questions together and then we can come back for your final comments. Peter Keogh, do you want to go first? Hi, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. It's Peter Keogh here from the Open University. Brilliant presentation, Mike. I'll just uh, ask a very brief question, which is, I guess, those of us who've been involved in similar kind of debacles um, more recently um, have really developed um, a, a notion of the university as almost a kind of ideal an ideal environment for um, the kinds of strategic litigation and strategic interventions by right and far right in order to gain greater social and political gains. So the university becomes a kind of becomes a kind of um, becomes a kind of crucible within which these gains are developed. And that I think has certainly happened in the last few years. So I guess my question was, is, do you think that the Harrington case, were they acting strategically or opportunistically? Um, to what extent there, and, and also what, what agendas were furthered by, um, by the debacle in the end, and you describe certain agendas, I guess, at the beginning of your talk, in terms of, of, of conservatism. But yeah, I'd like, I'd, it'd be lovely if I could get your reflection on what perhaps the difference is between now and 40 years ago in relation to these kind of things. Well, Great question, Peter. So, okay, Michael, can I just get Peter Scott to come in as well? Is that okay? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry, yeah, thank you very much. Peter Scott. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes good. Please. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mike. That was really good. Um, I can remember as a young journalist, some of it actually happening, uh, but it's good to have all the detail. Um, what strikes me listening to your account of it is that in a way, a solution was available relatively early on, um, but the then directorate just couldn't make up their minds. They did that effectively. Um, and as a result, made the situation worse. And it took... John Beesham, back to, I think we should give her credit, by the leader of the ILEA, actually taking decisive action to cut, cut through this. Um, and it strikes me there might be some lessons for the current situation. I mean, essentially, the situation we're in is, it, essentially, we're going to be dealing with incompatible, uh, quite legitimate, but rather incompatible, and they have to be juggled. Pragmatic solutions have to be found. And... I think the worst thing is that if people feel that the kind of university management aren't getting a grip on this, I mean, so I think 
if management are seen as taking dec decisive action, it won't please everyone, but it will please sufficient consensus. I think that will cut through many of the kind of incompatible problems we might be facing with the current legislation. I was interested in what your view might be on that, Michael. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'll try and be quick this time. Um, I think in in relation to the first, at, at the time, um, there were there was an I mean there were some people who had a very strong agenda and it and it was an agenda against um, what they perceived or believed to be you know, it was against it was definitely an agenda against the the left if you like um, but there were many people involved uh, who didn't have that agenda who did sincerely believe it was all about free speech. Um, and I think that's all always tends to be the case. That, uh, and this is some of one of the things that worries me, uh, that, that um, some of the people with a strong agenda can, in a sense, mask it by bringing in lots of other people who very, very sincerely believe that there is a, that there should be an absolute freedom of speech. In relation to Peter's uh, question, I think, yes, the then it, it was i suppose in a sense to be put it was easier for the person who had uh, a decisive action to come in after he'd been able to see the failure of passive and indecisive action but i think um and and i think that that particular person john Beesham, understood the left um in a way that the previous director uh, have, have really not had the kind of experience of an inner city polytechnic with many mature students and many students from different backgrounds. He just, uh, I, I don't think, had the equipment to do it, whereas John Beeson did. I do think decisive action um, can be, as you say, uh, what's needed. But I think it's also action based on an understanding of a diversity of viewpoints. And there has to be good internal communication and understanding. I mean, you're never going to have complete agreement within an, inst within, an, within an institution. But if it's going to be able to handle it, it needs to understand the institution and have good internal communication and understanding and some, at least some degree of trust. In the Polytechnic at that time, what trust there was, as I said before, it wasn't very cohesive because it was relatively newly founded. It had had unfortunate experiences, if you like, on the way through. And what trust there was was blown apart by the handling of that particular crisis. And I think there are, there are lessons for the present by seeing it in reverse. That was an example of what actually uh, was a failure. I think there are some lessons for, for what could make a success. But it's difficult, and it's difficult if the climate's not um, conducive. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think your, the lessons, the history lessons, are salutary. I think um, your, your principle to the ending by you know having trust, having understanding, seeking to understand, would seem to be good, good general sort of principles for any higher education leader. But um, as you say, the context was one of uh, on and undermining financial crises, political pressure from the Thatcher government. So it, it, in some ways, it was. It was building up to be a storm, wasn't it? And and um, and then there was a touch paper which sort of set, set it all alight. Thank you for all your energy in putting this together, Michael. I really hope you can um, get a chance to to write this all up. Um, we'd love to have it as a working paper for Central Global Education. Everyone um, who's came today, thank you very much. Um, we'll post the transcript and the um, recording on the site um, in the couple of days. You're welcome again um, next week. We have a, a webinar series starting um, on enabling change, and this one is called Science and Engineering Program Leaders, Reflections on Educational Intention. So do join us as ever um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thank you all for coming, and Michael, well done. Thank you very much again. Thank you.